Thank you very much indeed, Claire, and good evening to you all. I'm not sure who's there, but um, I understand there's quite a, a good audience. And um, I'm going to outline, first of all, the background to what happened, uh, why HMS Belfast was created in the first place, the political situation which uh, led to um, her construction and launch. Um, the situation in the at the end of the First World War was that Germany was required to make reparations. And as a country, they felt very bitter about this. And the winning countries, if you like, France, America, Britain, insisted that Germany was limited in what they could do. So there were various um, meetings were arranged and there was the treaty, the, what's called the Washington Treaty in, in the 1925, which limited the number of uh, cruisers and battleships that could be built, particularly by the, the main maritime powers, Italy, Japan, Great Britain, France, and of course the United States. <clears throat> but let's go back in time. Where does the word cruiser come from? Um, cruiser actually used to be spelt with a Z, C-R-U-I-Z-E-R, -E and it goes back to the Napoleonic Wars um, when they were built in big numbers, 112 cruisers were built. They were um, obviously sailing warships ships built to a, a, a single design, um, and they had, uh, they, they were designed to be fast and with three masts, both well armed, but able to nip in and out of battle. So they weren't going to form, uh, broadsides with the fleet, but they were going to act independently. They were a, a, a ship sloop, basically, it was called. Um, so that actually is not dissimilar to the role of cruisers in the 1930s. Um, the cruiser class of the first half of the 20th century denoted a ship capable of independent employment on a foreign station. This meant that the crew had to have ability to make running repairs and have a large radius of action and to be a scout for a fleet of battleships and obviously later aircraft carriers to be on hand to provide firepower to deter, to deter colonial trouble or problems in what was then called the British Empire, as well as to protect the trade interests of us, us British the British Isles, who are, have always been a maritime nation dependent on shipping to bring food, etc., to protect our trade interests. Um, the other purpose was to extend the influence, Britain's influence around the world by showing the flag. Um, so into the First World War, Admiral of the Fleet Jackie Fisher, who completely reconstructed the Royal Navy at the time, described the cruisers as eggshells armed with sledgehammers. Um, and this was before the advent of radio. So large numbers were required. But with the arrival of radio and later radar, um, the need for such huge numbers uh, disappeared. So previously, Britain protecting its empirical interests needed large numbers of cruisers, but any potential foe, perhaps France, Germany, etc., uh, only needed a few to cause any trouble. Um, but with the arrival of radio, the whole balance between uh, the numbers was, was changed. Um, the French had always traditionally been the enemy, if you like, um, 
and they were interested in winning an economic war. They call this la guerre industrielle. Forgive my pronunciation. My wife is French Canadian. She will correct me. Um, and the French thought that that could make Britain bankrupt. But as I said before, radio changed all that. Um, so here we have Her Majesty's ship Belfast, pennant number C Charlie 35. And the badge that was chosen was the seahorse. And it was Commander Ferguson who was the first engineer officer when she was launched. And I'll, I'll read this out because it's quite nicely written. I recall that the ship was without a crest before the launch. We're talking about 1938. Being the first Belfast ever, job number 1000 in, in Belfast shipyard, and that, having the skeleton of a seahorse I picked up on the shores of Lake Avernus, um, this idea of a crest was born, particularly as the seahorse appears also in the crest of the city of Belfast. My drawing was passed from the Admiralty to the College of Heralds, who arranged the red gorged crown for the seahorse and presumably had it redrawn. I had a letter back from the Admiralty informing me that the design was accepted with this minor modification. And on Trafalgar Day, 1971, when of course Belfast was then a, a private museum ship in the ownership of the Imperial War Museum, I had the seahorse with me and gave it to the Admiral. That would be Giles Morgan. So I hope I've given you an idea of, of the background of, of why these cruisers were built. And there she is today, HMS Belfast by Tower Bridge in London, where under normal times, not this year and last year with COVID, she gets more than a quarter of a million visitors a year. And you can see her in her camouflage paint, which was used during World War II to disrupt any visual sighting as far as possible. And on board, if you go and visit her, you'll see the battle on this board. And I'll be going through her career, if you like, which is quite distinguished, uh, covering uh, Arctic convoys, protecting the, the British and American convoys to Russia, uh, the North Cape battle, which was when Scharnhorst was uh, sunk, uh, much to the annoyance, to say the least, of Hitler. Uh, she was the very important D-Day coordination ship and carried out naval gunfire support at Normandy in 1944. And she was very involved with Korea in 1950 to 52. But a little bit more detail on that later. Um, going back to the raison d'etre for a, a cruiser, this table, which we don't need to look at in detail, but it just gives you an idea of the number of uh, battleships. And I'll come on to the cru cruisers later. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> that were being built by the different countries. So you've got um, Great Britain here, uh, United States, so uh, Great Britain's building King George V, Prince of Wales, and three others. These in 1937. The United States, two ships were ordered in 1937, and four more projected. Japan was building four battleships. France, uh, another three. And um, we've got Germany laying down four. Uh, of the battleships, the famous one, Scharnhorst, Neisner, Graf Spey, and I'll remember the fourth one in a minute, and Italy too. So there was something of an arms race going on. Um, Germany was very divided between whether to go all out for a U-boat war, which was very successful against Britain during the First World War in strangling uh, provisions and trade and essential um, hardware, if you like, for the UK, 
or whether to have a mix of battleships and they didn't realize that the aircraft carrier was making that such things redundant, which of course Japan found to her cost as well. The aircraft carrier was going to be the way forward. And then we can have a quick look at the cruisers. Um, so in 1936, Britain had uh, three. This didn't seem to want to work. Oh, there we are. Um, got the United States here, just one. Um, France, one. Italy, one. And Germany, actually, none at that point. But uh, the ones launched. Great Britain six, United States five, Japan one, France one, Italy two, and Germany still none. Um, and then laid down in 1936, Britain obviously saw the need for cruisers. The convoy system should have been reintroduced much more quickly at the, uh, at the start of World War II, but the cruisers were going to be extremely useful in convoy duty and with aircraft carriers. So five were laid down, making a total of 14. The United States saw the need for them 12, Japan nearly four, France six, Italy three, and Germany three. So Germany were concentrating on the U-boats. How is, how is Belfast designed? Well, she was quite big, 613 feet overall, 63 feet in the beam, with a displace, displacement of 10,420 tons. Now, uh, the displacement were limited by the Washington Treaty, uh, 1930, I think it was, and then the later London Treaties of 1936 um, to 11,000. The Japanese broke those. Um, and the Germans too. But a draft of 17 foot, it's quite big, shaft horsepower, powerful 80,000, speed 32 and a half knots. And I'll show you the range that Belfast could steam uh, with oil consumption. Um, her armament was 12 of the six inch triple turrets. Uh, that was uh, two mounted forward, two mounted aft, and they had a pretty formidable rate of fire. Each barrel could last 1,100 rounds, but would fire a projectile um, to London Airport, actually, from where she is moored now in the River Thames, just under 25,000 yards, so 12 miles. Um, and... The rate of fire could be eight to 10 missiles from each of the 12 turrets, so pretty formidable. Um, she had the four inch um, high angle anti-aircraft twin mountings, and they could pump out at 80 degree elevation, um, quite a, up to a height of 30,000 feet, uh, again, pretty powerful. And then she had what were known as the two pounders, the Chicago piano pom-poms. She had 16 of those. Um, and then she had some depth charges and torpedoes as well. So reasonably formidable. Uh, she was launched the same, same year as HMS Edinburgh, but she was one of 12. She was the uh, more advanced the previous 10 were the Southampton class, who weren't quite as formidable. Um, she had four Admiralty three drum boilers, uh, two side by side, one midships and one further aft. And her main engines were the four of the Parsons geared turbines, made appropriately enough by Harlan and Wolf in Northern Ireland. Evaporators for fresh water, auxiliary machinery, of course, generators, diesel generators, air compressors. 
And I've explained her main armament. Um, it was switched by the Admiralty. Originally, they were going to go for uh, four guns in each mounting, and then they changed it to three because of the top weight. And it was the main battery gun used by RN cruisers from 1930 through World War II. Uh, we've covered the secondary armament. Um, we can move on to the next slide. And there we are, the, the launch day. This was 17th of March, 1938, uh, St. Patrick's Day, appropriately. And she was launched by Neville Chamberlain's wife with the traditional words, of course, God bless her and all who sail in her. Um, cheering crowds and very proud uh, workforce in Northern Ireland and in Belfast have built HMS Belfast. And there you see them cheering. She had some very uh, distinguished captains. Um, Captain Scott was the first one. Uh, and Param Scott was captain when um, Belfast captured Cap Nort. I'll explain more of that in a minute. And also hit a mine, which changed her her life for the next two years or so. And she was quite badly damaged. And I'll show you a slide of the damage by a German magnetic mine quite soon after. The war started in September. This was in November. Um, and the magnetic mine wasn't really known by the British. It was a rather clever discovery by the, by the Germans. And they laid mines in the North Sea uh, where sweeps would be done to check that the, the big um, battleships weren't escaping from uh, Wilhelmshaven or wherever in, in, in Germany. Uh, captain Parham was the captain when she was uh, involved in the sinking of the Shan horse. There we are, I'll underline him. He went on to become a uh, fourth sea lord, in fact, eventually. And in fact, nearly all these captains uh, achieved a measure of, of success. The one I'll particularly come on to is Captain Morgan, Morgan Giles. And um, when I wrote the book, I was helped hugely by his daughters, in particular Ali Belitho, who lives in Cornwall, um, who allowed me access to a lot of private papers and a, a private book that uh, Admiral, then Admiral Sir Morgan, Morgan Giles, had published just for his family to read. So I felt quite privileged. And of course, I don't know if we can get the, you can see the top of the slide, but this is the flag officers who flew their flag in uh, HMS Belfast. She was an ideal flagship. She had an admiral's quarters as well as captain's, and she had a special operations room for the, for the admiral uh, when he was conducting fleet maneuvers. But of course, there was always a slight tension between the captain, whose ship it was, and the admiral, whose fleet it was, and there had to be a balance between the two. Um, but you can probably know some of these names. Um, Rear Admiral Lefanu, for example, uh, was going to be first Sea Lord, um, but sadly died in 1968. Ooh, I didn't mean to cross him out, sorry. Vice Admiral Beryl Begg um, became one of the uh, second Sea Lord, I think. I remember him visiting us mere cadets at Dartmouth Training College. Uh, in 1962, and he seemed a formidable man at the time, but they all went through pretty harrying times in the Second World War. And of course, uh, 
Vice Admiral Dalrymple Hamilton was captain um, during the D-Day, but we'll come on to that in a minute. So we've got um, just a, a few of the personality of, of the ship. I'm not sure why. No, I'm trying to get rid of this whiteboard and I can't. There we are. Thank you. HMS Belfast badge is uh, a blue badge. Upon waves in base white and blue, seahorse gorged with a mural crown proper. And it was one that was fondly regarded by her different crews because the motto was pro tanto quid retribuamus which formally is translated for so much, how shall we repay? But the sailors just said, we give as good as we get. And her bell um, was had to have a special uh, design. And my Lord's commissioners would be glad if they could be consulted concerning the design of any devices which the city council may desire to have engraved on the bell. Because... Belfast City Council paid for the bell and presented it to the ship, uh, not to give it to the ship, but if the ship was ever scrapped, it would return to Belfast. It was still the property of the council. Um, you can see that uh, it had to be a watch bell of service pattern and size with the ship's name legibly engraved or cast thereon and is to be of the following dimensions. 19 inch inside diameter, etc., etc., And that's how it looks. Now, it's quite strange because that bell, indeed, is on board HMS Belfast in the River Thames. And my wife, Francine, and I went to do research for the book to the city of Belfast. And we went to the Belfast Museum and we were shown a bell they said was the one that Belfast had. So this is slightly a mystery that there could be two bells. But that's something that maybe I'll reconcile one day. And Belfast is, I think, the only non-serving ship that's permitted to fly the White Ensign, which normally indicates a Royal Navy ship in active commission. And there we are. So she was built launched and completed by September and commissioned by September, well, actually August 1939, and war broke out in uh, September, in the first when Germany invaded Poland, and she was straight away uh, involved, sent up to Scarpa, and there she is, ready to go. Um, her complement, just to give you a, a feel for the size of the ship, uh, she had a normal, as a private ship, she would uh, have 24 officers, but as a flagship, she had the uh, accommodation for 37. And uh, the gun room is where the midshipmen live, and you'd have seven warrant officers, 13 or 10 if she's a private ship. Chief Petty Officers and Men, 188, but 160 is a private ship. Ratings in broadside messes. Well, broadside messing doesn't happen anymore now. It's a canteen service, but in those days you had a senior leading hand who would go and collect the food for his mess, and it would get pretty cold by the time it arrived from the, uh, from the kitchens. So 634 or private ship 580. Um, so total of 881, uh, it's 100 more as a private ship 780. And then a peacetime complement would be 582 or 542. Gives you an idea of, of what was involved. Um, trying to get rid of this whiteboard again. Thank you. So not only did she have guns, but before radar was really getting well developed, 
she had two walrus aircraft. Um, looks a bit like the old string bag swordfish, but that was very useful for gun spotting, reconnaissance, looking for U-boats, periscopes, and so on. And in fact, um, then Midshipman Terence Lewin, who later became Admiral of the Fleet, Lord Lewin, who was in charge of the Navy during the Falklands, um, took this photograph as a midshipman, and I was very pleased and privileged to be able to show it. And as I said, her first job was into the North Sea Scarpa, and there's a picture of her with other Royal Naval cruisers. Um, in particular, she was involved in sweeping for any uh, German attacks in the North Sea, but then was assigned to quite a number of the Arctic convoys. And in was an unfortunate uh, incident that in November 1939, she struck the German mine I told you about in the Firth of Forth. And this created a buckling uh, along the whole keel of the ship. And it meant that she had to go back to Devonport for major repairs, which took over two years. So she was out of commission for two years. But she had quite an interesting uh, encounter with about a month before this, on the 9th of October, with a German merchantman called Cap Nort, North Cape, and who claimed to be innocent the month, a year, sorry, a month after war was declared. And she claimed that she was just carrying innocent cargo to Germany. She was stopped and midshipman Terence Lewin uh, was in charge of the sea boat in very rough conditions that went alongside to investigate further. He was suspicious and indeed they found a, no a great number of ex-service personnel who were the Captain Ort was trying to smuggle to Germany to join her armed forces. So the Captain Ort was taken uh, under escort into harbour in, in uh, Rosyth. Um, so she had this two-year refit and was at the same time brought up to date. Her radar was improved, her guns overhauled, uh, but Majorly, she had her, uh, her hull strengthened, um, which gives me the opportunity to look briefly at the navigational aspect of HS Belfast. Um, the only radar they had really was uh, a little bit later on, 974, which was quite a good navigational radar, but also uh, good for spotting periscopes in the sea. Um, but the main navigational instrument, of course, was the Eyeball Mark I and what was called deduced or dead reckoning. So the old chart capabilities would be very important. She had an echo sounder and this was in the chart house where they had a direction finding set. She had two compasses. One was the standard Admiralty gyro, and uh, one was a, a standby in the wheelhouse. And she had an ARL uh, plotting table, Admiralty Research Laboratory. They're always known as ARL tables um, on the lower bridge. The upper bridge was open for until the end of the war which made it very interesting to sail to uh, Mamansk with the sort of weather that she had to have. And just a little note here, her propellers were outboard turning when proceeding ahead. Um, she had four propellers, in fact, which gave her great maneuverability. And she was considered a beautiful ship to sail and navigate. 
Um, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is an open bridge conning in, showing the conning instruments that she would have had at the time. And you've got here the uh, main gyro compass, the standby, the polaris, the magnetic compass. And um, then you've got uh, the engine room repeaters, echo sounder, uh, the old voice pipe down to the wheelhouse. And it was, this was all in the top bridge and we'll have a, a view of the top bridge later on. Try and clear the whiteboard, thank you. Um, as a navigator, it was very important that you understood uh, and advised the captain, uh, particularly on passage making, just what amount of fuel would be expended and the best economical speed, or if you were chasing a target, uh, what fuel you would be using up. And you can see there's quite a difference between, say, 10 knots, where the range would be 5,380, uh, with 4.1 tons of FFA expended an hour. Compare that with uh, when she's doing, say, 26 knots, her range would only be 3,000, nearly half, um, with a lot more fuel expended compared to uh, a lower speed. So a navigator would be required to advise the captain the most economic, he would have to work out the passage uh, and a, a, a safe, both from coastal navigation and ocean navigation. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, I'll try and get, thank you. The navigator also would be responsible for advising the captain for uh, bringing the ship alongside or to moor uh, or to anchor. And the notes that uh, I found, as it says here, the ship handles very well, but she is a heavy ship and takes some stopping. When steadying on a new course, midship is 10 degrees before an opposite wheel, 3 to 5 degrees before for a slow swing and five to seven degrees of wheel for a fast swing. She has a fairly quick roll and is rather wet. It means she splashes through a rough sea. And just to give you an idea, um, the reductions in speed that they found worked uh, for anchoring uh, at 10 cables, you go to eight knots, three cables, stop both, all engines, sorry, at one cable, you go slower stern, increasing to half a stern as necessary. Similarly, the advice for mooring and for coming to a buoy. So this all required a certain artistic approach. It was um, something that captains prided themselves on good ship handling. Um, and a ship was judged when she returned to harbour or took a boy on how well she was handled in inshore waters. And this shows the plan that they used with success in calm conditions with just two boilers connected, approaching a boy with two shafts. And I thought I'd put this one in. If all else failed, the navigator's last result might be the ship's mascot in 1952 with a keen sense of smell. That's a bit tongue in cheek, I know, but uh, a lovely picture, a lovely dog. That was Captain Parham's dog. Um, and in fact, that's not so fanciful because Captain Cook discovered that the Polynesians in the Pacific during his um, first Pacific voyage, which was, I think, 1768, um, had befriended a Polynesian chieftain called Tupaya, and he explained how they would explore uh, the South Pacific, uh, and eventually over two and a half thousand years,
got to New Zealand um, through both dead reckoning and intuition and a natural appreciation. So they would smell the wind. If it was a shore wind, they'd realize that the sea was changing its shape and form. They'd see um, birds that were shore birds swimming, uh, flying out to sea, all this sort of natural things. Um, they didn't need uh, GPS. And this is just for your interest, a chart of Polynesia drawn by Co Captain Cook with the Polynesian chief Tupia in 1764. Sorry, I got the date wrong earlier. And it's in terms of distance and juxtaposition, it's actually remarkably accurate showing the Polynesian islands as they, the Polynesians, understood it. But what we had was the Admiralty chart of the 1940s. And this is something that I was very familiar with when I did a bit of navigating. Um, of course, now they've changed their design yet again and are GPS friendly, if you like. Um, so I went through the key events um, of Belfast's role in World War II. We've mentioned the Cap Nort and how she was then damaged by a mine. Um, and it wasn't until 1942 that she got back in into action with the Arctic convoys. The, the famous date just after Christmas in 1943, she sank the Shan horse. And then she was involved with the D-Day landings, um, then went to Sunderland for a refit. Uh, to make her fit for Far East service in the tropics because it was known then, or it was thought it was known, that Japan would, would have to be fought island by island and into the mainland possibly for two or three years. And the atomic bomb wasn't foreseen except by a very few people who, who knew about the secret. So the idea was that she would join a powerful fleet with the Americans in Japan, ready to invade Japan, and that wasn't necessary. But she was deployed in the Far East from June 1945. Um, I thought I'd show you the intensity of the activity by extracts from Belfast's log. Um, and you can see that in 1942, uh, she left Plymouth for Scarpa. That was after the two-year refit and repairs, joined the 10th cru cruiser squadron of the home fleet in Scarpa on Christmas Day, and then was rendezvousing at Seidesfjord, Iceland, to start convoy duties. Um, and here she's in company with other cruisers, Cumberland, Sheffield, and destroyers. Um, February, she's leaving Cytus Ford with a Russian convoy, JW-53. She wasn't involved with the famous convoy, PQ-17, where the uh, first Sea Lord Admiral Sir Dudley Pound gave that terrible order for the convoy to scatter uh, with the most terrible consequences. But the convoy system itself, with, with the consequences that uh, a number of... Uh, Two thirds of the uh, merchantmen were sunk uh, with no protective carrier or destroyers. Uh, they were picked off one by one by the Germans. But generally, the convoys were extremely successful um, and relatively few were sunk. The convoy system worked. So she was in Mamanx, March the 1st, uh, Kola Inlet, which is up in Russia. Um, then she, uh, you can see that she was involved with various ships and various convoys going to Iceland, back to Iceland again, and, uh, arriving at Scarpa for mine laying operations. Um, then she was, uh, eventually got some leave for a scythe 
and a quick docking back to Scarpa. Uh, Operation Camera was a diversionary sweep in July um, off Norway to exploit during the Sicilian la landings, Hitler's continued fear of an Allied counter invasion of, of Norway. Uh, the operation was successful because the cruisers were mistaken for a transport convoy, and this made Hitler um, divide his forces. In fact, he thought that the Allies were going to invade Crete, not Sicily. Um, but that's another story. So we clear this one. And just quickly looking at a bit more, the Russian convoys of 1943, you get a, an idea of the intensity of what she was involved with. Um, Her, His Majesty the King visited the home fleet August the 13th uh, in 1943. And again, another covering sweep for um, the rush to cover the Russian convoys. Um, going backwards and forwards between Havel Fjord and Scarpa. Um, there was a uh, suspected enemy breakout here on September the 25th of a blockade runner. And then she arrived back in Scarpa. And um, October 1943, she was back with the 10th Cruiser Squadron uh, in company with the Duke of York and some the U.S. aircraft carrier Ranger and the U.S. heavy cruiser Tuscaloosa to, a sh to attack shipping targets in the Bodo area with the air striking group from the U.S. carrier Ranger. Um, so it was about this time you can get an idea of the rough seas. There's the open bridge. Sorry, I'm flicking around with my open bridge there. You can see the gyro compass and Siemens all huddled up with their foul weather gear. She certainly ploughed through the, through the seas. And we get to the 26th of December. Um, I'll try and clear the whiteboard again. There we are. The Nazi battleship Kriegsmarine ship Scharnhorst, which was sunk by the Duke of York, Belfast with destroyers, including um, a Canadian destroyers who were involved with protecting the convoy that the Scharnhorst was sent out to attack. Um, Grand Admiral Raider, 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 had been dismissed by Hitler and Donuts. Donuts had uh, taken over as the Admiral in charge of the Nazi Navy and Hitler was very anxious to show um, some success for at least for propaganda purposes and um, sent the, Scha the Scharnhorst um, with a cruiser out to attack the convoy. Um, she was completely bamboozled because the convoy was a trap. And when she turned south, uh, the Duke of York, who had superior radar and Belfast radar as well, was instrumental in tracking the Scharnhorst. The Germans had very good um, gunnery radar for short short range, <coughs> but their long range radar was way behind the Allies. And uh, they met <coughs> on the 26th of December and she was pummeled by destroyers, Duke of York and Belfast and other ships. And the RN Wydensen and Canadian flag commemorate the 60 Canadians in HMS Belfast and HMS, the Canadian destroyers, Haida, Huron, and Iroquois, that covered the convoy that Scharnhorst attacked, uh, after which she was sunk. So it's quite a nice shot of the uh, 2018 anniversary 
and both these flags were quite rightly hoisted together. Um, back to D-Day, uh, Winston Churchill was desperately keen to attend the actual D-Day landings and insisted on uh, going out in Belfast. Belfast was <coughs> conducting the Juno landing and gold and was also doing the naval uh, gunfire support. And um, she was able to uh, put out of action a number of the beachhead guns. Um, it was the king who personally wrote to King George and said, please do not go with the first attacking force. Um, your sincere friend, George R.I. Um, but he, King George, had visited Belfast uh, in May. He knew when D-Day was going to take place. And it was to rouse the fleet and to give them uh, encouragement. And he was, the Belfast steamed up and down the moored lines of, of ships at Scarpa. So we finished the war. Um, Belfast was, um, as we, as you saw earlier, was sent out to the Far East, um, thinking that there would be a long Japanese war. It didn't happen, but she stayed out in the Far East. Um, and was instrumental in um, helping to reintroduce the prisoners of war um, that they discovered in Shanghai, British prisoners of war and Dutch and uh, many Europeans who had to be reintegrated into normal life. Um, and it was during this time in 1949 that we had the famous HMS Amethyst incident um, with the Communist Chinese and Belfast was in Hong Kong at that time. Um, the Korean War broke out in June 1950 and here's a shot of Belfast with the mountains of North Korea behind her job during the Korean War was, again, gunfire support for the army and landing um, troops who were going to do uh, behind-the-scenes attacks. And you can see the guns themselves in action here. This is courtesy of Admiral Fleet Lord Lewin's uh, personal photographs but uh, that's that's what she was she was a gunship and then um, a nice shot of Belfast returning um, after service in Korea uh, coming back at, at speed coming back to Portsmouth and this was uh, the end of the Korean War. She then went into reserve in 1952 in Devonport until 1956 when she underwent an extensive refit until 1959 and then she was recommissioned under Captain Morgan Morgan Giles. But here's a shot of her um, when she went back to the Far East. This is the dry dock in Singapore which I can remember. I think it's been filled in now. But uh, the dry docks in Singapore Naval Base had to be big enough to take a battleship. Um, and you can see there's quite a lot of room. And um, they had a, an exercise with the Royal Australian Navy in the Coral Sea. And they were at sea for some time. And you can see, I hope this brings a smile to your face. Um, there was an opportunity to grow beards. And uh, this, this cartoon appeared in the ship's magazine at that time. Who are you? <laughs> and then um, this was a shot of Belfast in Sydney under the famous Sydney Harbour Bridge uh, with Captain Morgan Morgan Giles. 
Um, she, she was on a round the world visit in 1961, and she then traveled to uh, Dar es Salaam um, for the independence of Tanganyika, which became Tanzania in December 61, which the Duke of Edinburgh, God rest his soul, um, represented the country. Um, and then she continued her tour around the world. She went to uh, Guam, Pearl Harbor across the Pacific, San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver, Victoria, Eskimalt, which I looked up is the southern tip of Vancouver Island, and then transited the Panama Canal, uh, Trinidad, and back to home sea service. But uh, when she got to San Francisco, there was a very embarrassing episode because um, heroin was discovered on board. It was the Chinese laundry who thought that they could make a fortune by smuggling heroin, which gave rise to this amusing um, cartoon by Jack, which appeared in the, I think it was the Daily Mail, um, where when the visiting American Admiral came on board, um, Captain Morgan Morgan Giles was uh, meant to have said, I can assure you, sir, that Belfast is a very happy ship. And here they are all smoking whatever heroin. Um, so she completed that commission, came back uh, after a year away to Portsmouth, and you can see her just coming alongside now. There is, I couldn't identify which uh, carrier this is here, but you can see a scimitar on the fly flight deck, and that's all the uh, families uh, looking forward to meeting up with their husbands or boyfriends or whatever once again after a long absence. Um, and so she was put into home sea service um, and then paid off into reserve in Devonport once more in 1963, um, having been pulled out for a brief time for a reserve the Royal Naval Reserve to take her to Gibraltar and back, but that was only a couple of months. And she was um, in reserve in Devonport until 1971, when Captain Morgan Morgan Giles, who by then had left the Navy, having been promoted Rear Admiral, and uh, stood as an MP for Winchester, and he was elected MP, but it was he who really got uh, the idea of preserving Belfast as a museum ship for the nation. Um, and in 1971, um, it was announced and called Operation Seahorse, appropriately, that she would be moved to the Pool of London, where she is now. And then in 1978, she was transferred to the Imperial War Museum. Um, so this is a shot of her receiving a new mask, which the Russian uh, Federation of Companies had funded to the tune of a million pounds because they regard Belfast with great affection because she did so much to protect her, uh, to protect their convoys. Um, and we can now see Belfast today in wartime camouflage paint, uh, open to visitors. As I said earlier, she has about uh, uh, 250,000 um, a year. And I just thought as a, a final thing, because I think it's getting up to an hour now, um, I just read out... Um, a little tribute. She serves to remind us all of the debt we owe to the Royal Navy in protecting this island nation and that we depend on trade and food from, from throughout the world with some 95% coming by sea.
grand survival. The Kaiser and the Nazis nearly starved Great Britain during two world wars with their U-boat campaigns, and we should never let ourselves be hostage to such a situation again. As a collective tribute to the Royal Navy and the Merchant Navies, she is representative of all classes of ship. And there she is at sunset taken 2020, March last year, um, from the masthead camera supplied by, uh, a, again, a Russian company. Um, I should point out that the Duke of Edinburgh came to the topping out ceremony when uh, the new tripod, the, the new masts were put in. So he remembers HMS Belfast with some affection. And uh, a quick little plug for my book, uh, HMS Belfast Pocket Manual, which is being sold on board when they're open in the Imperial War Museum, which I'm delighted. Um, and I think that draws my, um, my talk to a close, but I'd be delighted to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you very much for listening.